The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. So Paul begins here by reminding us of our total depravity and of our condition, if he had left us to ourselves, but he's wonderful, but God's in Paul, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love of which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. And seated us with him in the heavenly places, to show the excellence of his grace. And then he highlights grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this next qualifier, that not of yourselves, is in a, a tense or a case that uh, this is referring to faith, not to salvation. And the faith not of yourselves is also a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. But, as we noted last week, uh, good works must follow, for this is God's end in saving us, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And part of that is revelation to us of his law that we're also going to consider uh, tonight. And then what I want to try to do, I did this last year, it worked fairly well. I'm going to assign each of you, including the video conferencing students, um, commandments to come in and be prepared to give at the most, since there's uh, going to be about 22 people doing this, uh, a two or three minute summary. Okay, just to give me a quick summary of your assignment with respect to the law. And we're going to start with number 39 and go through um, 83. Now, this won't come out exactly even, but that's okay. So, uh, Mr. Blizzard, I want you to do uh, 39 and 40. Mr. Blotzer, I want you to do 41 and 42. Mr. Cook, I want you to do uh, 43 and 44. I'm going to skip the commandments in terms of somebody reading them. Um, so, Mr. Dwyer, you will do 46 and 47. Um, Matthew Ezel, you will do 48. Why don't you do 48 to Mr. Dwyer, and you would do 50, and, uh, well, I can't, I, I, I can't, no, never mind, just do what I said, 40, and you would do uh, 
48 and 50. Uh, Mr. German, you or your wife will do 52 and 53. No, not 53. 52 and 54. Mr. Hom, you will then have 55 and 56. Mr. Horner will have 58 and 59. Mr. Huggle, is he Hugel or Huggle? That is Hugel. Okay, Hugel, 59 and 60. Mr. Humkey, you will have 61 and 62. I don't, let's see. Mr. Monty, if you hear this, um, you will have 64 and 65. Mr. Melton, you will have 66 and 68. Eight. And when Vinicius gets here, somebody help me remind me to tell him he has um, 69 and 71. Kenneth Pijak, you will have, no, you're not going to be here next week. Pardon? You won't be here next week. Could you give me a two-minute summary? Where are we? 72 in. 72 and 74. Mr. Rios, you will have 75 and 77. Mr. Rutherford, you will have 78 and 80. I know it's dividing them up, but it's the only way I can do this equitably. Uh, Dr. Python? Yeah. And uh, it's total speaking. Uh, is it from catechism? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, shorter or larger? Shorter catechism. Thank you. I'm uh, sure I wasn't clear. Okay. Where was I? Mm. All right, Mr. Togel, you've got 80 and 81 of the shorter catechism. Mr. Thomas? You've got 82 and 83, and Mr. Vogel, you will have 84 and 85. I don't know if Mr. Williams will be around or not, so we'll stop there. So, it's just a, it's a way to get you all uh, exposed to uh, and so some of you, it's divided now, so some of you are going to have what is required, and others are going to have what is forbidden, but that's okay if there's even repetition. But, uh, just to get you a bit into, we don't, just don't have time in this course to go into uh, an extensive discussion, probably or redesign it to maybe spend a whole class on going through this, but uh, this will help us get through it, and I will pop in with uh, various things then. So this throws us off our schedule, but I, I think it's important to do the law. Do you want a two-minute summary of each of them? Or two no, of what you've been assigned. So it'll be a minute summary of each. So 84 and 85 or two, two minutes in total? Like two in minute. total. Two or three in total. Okay. So test your precision. And we're to get scripture references and just give a rep. No, you would explain in your own words what is required or forbidden by the commandment. If you want to bring in some scripture, that's fine. But just to give a summary of, of what is either forbidden, required, or promised. So it's sort of pretending that you're going through asking us, what right. is this part, what is this part? We're just yeah, cutting out the time good. of that. And you want to come up here? <laughs> I like your pearls. Thank you. Hello. I'm sorry, Mike. That's all right. Now, did I make you an assignment or not? Do it. What? <laughs> did I read your name? You wouldn't know, would you? 
Are you, sorry, are you talking about an assignment? I'm a little bit lost here. I know, I am too. Okay. <laughs>
unto sanctification and glorification. And so the whole ball of wax, it's daily repentance and faith, but we also must be making in faith diligent use of um, the word, the prayer, and the sacraments for our growth uh, in uh, grace. So we want to look now at faith and repentance. Uh, and in paragraph one, I'll read it, but uh, Mr. Blotz will be thinking, where does faith occur or take place? The grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the state of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word, by which also and by the administration of the sacraments and prayer it is increased and strengthened. So where is, uh, what's the abiding place of faith, Mr. Blotzer? Uh, in our hearts. It's in our heart. And what's the heart? That's still to you, sir. Oh, sorry. Um, um, our heart is that, uh, that inward man, our soul, or, I don't know. It's okay, it's the control word. room of our lives. It would be that it would consist of the faculties of the intellect and the affections and the will. It's the very center of our being. And faith and repentance are going to operate in those three spheres of intellect, affections, and will. And so it's important to recognize this is where faith is born. Now when it says ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word why do you think it says ordinarily? That's a smiley face question. Anybody? Is that just an open question? Um, yeah. Mr. Mr. Is that just an open question or are we asking someone specifically? I said it was, no, it was a oh. smiley face question. Okay. That means it's anybody. Because ordinarily upon regeneration, we would go to the church of Christ. Our, we would be. We would go to the Church of Christ to be to, to learn about it. Our, well, that's not the question, is it? It says that ordinarily faith is wrought by the ministry of the Word. Right. Ordinarily would mean then that uh, sometimes that might not be somebody out in ether world. I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, this is Mr. Horner. Um, ordinarily means that that's. that's the, the spirit ordinarily works, but God is free to work um, outside of those means if he so chooses. So then a person uh, in the darkest part of Africa who's never heard the gospel could ordinarily be called in some other way? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm saying that the Holy Spirit is free to work um, outside of those ordinary means. Um, so, are you saying what I just Oh, I now this, this is getting a little, uh, a little tricky now. <laughs> You're looking for the word extraordinary here? Well, I'm, I'm, I want you to dig yourself out of this hole. <laughs> so God... I, I, would, I, would, I would think about um, things like the Apostle Paul being converted on the road. Um, you don't think he knew the word? No, that would be quite, quite extraordinary. But you don't think he knew the word? I'm sorry? You don't think Paul had known the word? Well, I'm, I'm thinking in the context here, preaching the gospel. Well, it's just ordinarily apart from the word. It could be preaching, it could be the word read, the word communicated. What? Covenant for children that die in infancy. Very good. You have to get a smile on you. I mean, smiley face. Are you telling them the answer? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't know that. One. All right. Covenantal children that die in all by the word, but they are born again by the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting. We notice this today in Christ and Salvation, the chapter. Uh, on effectual call in paragraph three that deals with the elect infant sign and it uses the word regenerated and not effectual call. Whereas in the chapter is called effectual calling and they put what we would refer to as regeneration under effectual calling. We saw that last week. But uh, with the little ones, um, 
Those that God would regenerate in the womb or outside as little children, either that die or that grow up, uh, if they have been born again at that point, like John the Baptist or Jeremiah, the effectual call is not the same in their lives. It's going to be they're going to respond to uh, the glories of the gospel, the greatness of God as part of their growth in Christ. So I think that's why ordinarily is uh, put there. Um, the, the catechism is quite clear with respect to the calling of the gospel. And they who have never heard the gospel and so know not Jesus Christ nor believe in him be saved by their living according to the light of nature. They who have never heard the gospel know not Jesus Christ and believe not in him cannot be saved, be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature or the laws of that religion which they profess. Neither is there salvation in any other but in Christ alone, who is the Savior only of his body. Now, I think what you were uh, saying, Mr. Horner, was it wasn't just preaching. But the word is always used in the effectual calling for anybody that's of an age of accountability and have not been born again in infancy. Oh, you, you want to get back to me on that one, sir? Any, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes sir, I agree with that. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Good, thank you. Okay, so this is the normal way. This is going to be a way of our evangelism and discipleship and mentorship so that we communicate the gospel, we communicate law and gospel. And then notice that that faith is strengthened by the sacraments and prayer, increased and strengthened. So this is fleshing out when it says what is required to escape the wrath and curse of God. So God's given faith and given prayer to strengthen uh, our faith. Notice as well, uh, who is the author of faith? Cook. Okay, so it's the work of the Spirit in their hearts. And so it is a gift of grace, as we saw in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Uh, Canons of Dort, faith is therefore to be considered as the gift of God, not on account of its being offered by God to man to be accepted. So it's not that kind of gift or rejected as pleasure but because it is in reality conferred, breathed, and infused into him. Or even because God bestows the power or ability to believe, and then expects that man should, by the exercise of his own free will, consent to the terms of salvation and actually believe in Christ. But because he who works in man, both to will and do, and indeed all things in all, produces both the will to believe and the act of believing also. Very interesting little account. You can miss it. It's, it's almost a throwaway line, uh, but it's so important. Uh, when Peter and John uh, heal the lame beggar at Gate Beautiful, and uh, Peter's beginning to explain what happened, and he says in verse 16 of, of Acts 3, and on the basis of faith in his name, and that's Christ, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. Notice this, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Faith has come through Christ. So it's faith in Christ, but it's Christ himself who is the producer of the gift of faith as his spirit works faith in the um, inner man. Um, we discussed the nature of faith in paragraph 2. 
uh, Mr. Dwyer. By this faith, a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein and acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth. Yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. So, when we think here about faith, is saving faith a different thing from the belief that the Bible is the Word of God or God made this promise, I believe this promise to be true. The demons believe, right? In trouble. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. It's okay. No. <laughs> he's, a, he's an auditor. You're, you're having to ask the question. Fair enough. Um, at first blush, I'm tempted to say no, um, that they are different. Um, but I want proof from text for that. Well, I think it contradicted you. Sorry? I mean, there, the, the second part of that, the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting in Christ alone. So it's, it's meant, it, so the belief in Scripture as God's Word um, and the understanding, the belief in Christ as your only Savior um, I mean, obviously you can't, special revelation requires that we trust in it as true and authoritative first. So what, what do, would you infer from the language principal acts? Does that mean there are other acts of, of faith that's the same faith? Well, I mean, it seems to be fundamental. It's fundamental that I hear they're getting at. So the, the fundamentals of saving faith. Well, that's not the question. No. Are there two different kinds of faith in a person who is born again? Other than saving faith, what would be the other? Just a basic trust. A Christian believe it to be true. Where the word believe is, is a synonym for faith. Whatsoever is revealed in the Word, for the authority of God Himself speaking therein, and acteth, that means faith, acts differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, and embracing the promises of God. In other words, saving faith is a species of faith, but there's only one kind of faith that a regenerate person has. Now, the difference is made between fides specialis and fides generalis. Fides generalis, general faith, is not divorced from regeneration, but this is the faith that uh, God's speaking in His Word, it is His Word. Um, the very faith that takes hold of Christ for salvation is going to want to obey the commandments of God. You, you see that. It's, if you've got faith, if you have saving faith, then you believe what's promised and you obey what's commanded. And, and that's the point. There's no disjunction here. Faith is merely the way a person responds to the message of Scripture. Now that begins with the response that yes, God is speaking in this word. It's not necessarily to be saved that I've got to believe, even have thought about the fact that the Bible is the word of God. But I have come to a point God is speaking to me through the Bible. And it is God that is speaking. And that is a product of faith, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that really is going to be there, particularly from someone outside the church, uh, that um, begins to be exposed to the message of the Bible. And it continues then. And notice there's a two continuations. We 
often limit faith to justification, but what does this say? Sanctification. We don't do that ourselves either. We trust Christ as we use the means. We trust Christ by His Spirit. We saw that last week to sanctify us. Eternal life. We have taken hold of Christ for eternal life. But if you've done that, then that means you have saving faith. That means you're going to obey. And you're going to bolster yourself with the promises of God. And you're going to fear the threatenings of God. And you're going to grow in your grasp as you read Bible. This is God's Word. And when we get back to chapter 1, it says you use Scripture, the Spirit's testifying to you from Scripture of, of the veracity of Scripture. So, so you're saying, that what the divines are saying essentially is they're, they're different, but they happen simultaneously? No, no. It's, it's one faith. It's just, um, it's going to respond to the message. But it begins with this general faith that God's speaking to me. This is God's word to me. In my, in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I probably am, uh, if we believe in Scripture first as being the truth of God, and then that works out of that, a saving faith, it seems to smack of classical apologetics at where we're proving the basic foundations. Of no, we're not proving God. anything, though, you see. Well, sorry. No, no, that's the language. I shouldn't say proving. We, we Revealed are. for the authority of God himself speaking therein. Sure. So, what it is, is God speaking here. And God's telling me I'm a sinner. And God's telling me that he's got uh, salvation for me if I come to him the way he has appointed. So I don't know that there is a time lapse. But there, there can be because this, this general faith could be a product of the general illumination that takes place before regeneration uh, that we know people have. Uh, but it's got to be there, and so maybe it often is there. For example, the couple that I spent last Wednesday with, getting their testimony, they were anti, <coughs> they hated Christianity. And the first movement of the Spirit in her life was get a Bible and read it. She went and got a Bible. She didn't have a rational reason for getting the Bible. And as a family, so they had two children, um, as a family, they started reading through the Bible in Genesis 1. And they're reading along in the Bible in kind of in the dark until she read the story of Uzzah being stricken dead. And the Spirit, this was God speaking and she was in trouble. She was in trouble. And uh, through that process, so that would be the general illumination of the Spirit that takes place. Um, but then for the believer, the, its faith is how we accept the Word of God by the Spirit speaking through it and by the evidence, the internal evidences of the Scripture that are given to us in, in the first, uh, first chapter. But it's really important, you know, the faith is not some mysterious or disconnected thing in our experience it's part of the christian's response to god speaking in his word this also will keep us from bifurcating the christian experience thinking we can have christ as savior and later on have him as lord no the faith that takes him as savior is the faith that obeys his commandments are you saying like most people argue Presuppositional apologetics that everyone knows that there is a God. Mm -hmm. That whoever you're having a conversation with, even if they're an atheist, right. they know that there is a God. Yeah, Paul says that. Yeah, agreed. Um, with this, are you saying that there are certain people that don't know that the Bible is the Word of God? It would yeah. seem that the Bible fundamentally, since of its. You've got to read the Bible to come to that conclusion. It's the Word of God. Is it possible to read the Bible and not come to the conclusion? If the Spirit's not working in your heart, yes. So because that's blindness. Self... You see, there's a difference. When Paul says, all know there's a God, he's talking about the innate knowledge of God that's in us as image bearers of God, conscience, the law of God written on our hearts, and that is always suppressed. But he also says that we are blind. And so... 
uh, the atheist is suppressing the knowledge of God, but that doesn't mean he's suppressing the fact that, that this Bible is God's word. Uh, he's not maybe been exposed to the Bible. But once he has, can he walk away saying that it's not the word of God? If he's not illumined by the Spirit. That's why I think the language is important. That it is um, the authority of God himself speaking therein. And we're told back in chapter 1 that that is the Spirit. Notwithstanding the full assurance and persuasion assurance of infallible truth and divine authority there of us from the inward work of the Holy Spirit being witness by and with the word in our hearts. But that happens in the use of Scripture. So what I said to you back when we were there is, I don't have to prove to you the Bible is the Word of God. You maybe don't believe it's the Word of God. That's okay. You might not believe in electricity. There might be a, a, a terrorist that comes into the room and he's got this uh, thing that looks like um, uh, an Uzi. Matt would know the real thing. Uh, and uh, Matt thinks, that's a plastic Mattel toy. Now, that guy could do one of two things. He could put it down here on the desk and break it down and prove to Matthew that this is a real gun. But by that time, the big guy here would have taken him down. <laughs> All he has to do is point it at Matt and pull the trigger. Right? That's the Bible. We don't have to defend it. What does Spurk say? Let the lion out of the cage. So we don't have to defend it. No, they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. But I'm not worried about that. Because it's self-attesting as the Spirit will bless it. And so I am free to use the Bible, knowing that if the Spirit is going to work in them, then He's going to bring them to tremble before the God of the Bible. So that's how I put it together uh, as, uh, I guess, a fairly consistent until then. I think sometimes it's possible we overlook the fact that God uses his word to harden people and they become the justifies his justice right. for their own belief. Yeah, it's got with the spirit can make it a hardening thing as well. But they're not going to come to believe it without the spirit's work. Now that can be a general illumination that may or may not lead to regeneration. Um so there can be people that will not become regenerate that will have this conviction the Bible is the Word of God. Is a general illumination the same as general faith? No, general faith is faith. Um, so I don't want to call it faith. I want to call it general illumination. Now, admittedly, I think there's some ambiguity here in how theologians put this together as fides generalis. But mainly I think what is meant by that is faith generally in the truths of Scripture and not specifically in Christ. That's saving faith. But they're just two parts of, of, of the one thing. Can we say that like what you're saying about like a general faith could be a faith that's merely an intellectual ascent, but it's not a receipt. Okay, and that historical faith is normally the word that is used at that point. Yes. I was wondering because you said in regards to the couple that you mentioned, No, at that point, I simply meant illumination. Okay. Yeah, I misspoke. So be gripped by this fact that, that faith, which operates through your faculties, um, is always going to respond to the content of Scripture. Paragraph 2 also deals with the results of faith, and that is justification. So how is faith, Matthew, how is faith um, the instrument of justification? Um, because it accepts, receives, and rests upon Christ. Okay. Does it contribute anything? 
Does God accept our obedience because of faith? No. For justification? No. Okay. Very good. Uh, well, then, uh, Mr. German, how does faith relate to sanctification? Faith is the instrument that unites us to Christ, that <coughs> unites us to his spirit, that does the work of sanctification within us. So we take hold of Christ and union with him and believe that the spirit, as we ask him, will sanctify us. Now it's very important to notice the three aspects of faith. So it is laid out here in our paragraph two. Um, accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone. Uh, by the way, uh, question, Larger Catechism 73, Matthew gets back to that discussion. Faith justifies a sinner in the sight of God, not because of those other graces which do always accompany it, or of the good works or the fruits of it, nor as if the grace of faith or any act thereof were imputed to him for his justification, but only as it is an instrument by which he receives and applies Christ and his uh, righteousness. And so... Um, in God's wisdom, faith but a hand to receive a gift. So I was preaching on this uh, at Geneva College Sunday night. There was a little girl in the front row. So I said, all right, so I'm going to give you a doll. You, if you get up here, uh, and here's the doll, how are you going to receive the gift? You're going to put out your hand and take it. Did that mean you deserve it? I don't know you. Did you then earn God? I don't know you. And so faith is merely the way of receiving a gift. That's a good way to think about it. Another thing you can do, you preach it on faith. I, I made up this illustration and I love it, so it's why I'm Talking about faith as a gift. And so I say, imagine, it depends on wherever I am, it has to be cold. So if it's not cold, I make up a cold place. But anyway, imagine that you're uh, downtown Pittsburgh on a cold winter day and there's a beggar on the street. And a very benevolent, wealthy man comes by and he knows something of the circumstances of that man's life and he wants to help him. So he says, uh, my friend, if you give me a dollar, I will give you $100,000. And the man says, go away and quit mocking me. Why? He didn't have a dollar. He didn't have half a dollar. Then the rich man reaches into his pocket and he says, hey, here's the dollar. That's the gospel. God says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, do you know your heart? He says, I can't believe. That's right. You can't believe. And I'll give you the gift of faith as I bring you into myself. So it's the beauty of faith as the gift of God. Now, many people don't understand faith. They think it's kind of a blind leap. It's amorphous. Stand on the high dive, close your eyes, and uh, jump off. But we need to note here that faith has three aspects. And uh, they are knowledge, assent, and trust. Knowledge, assent, and trust. So when we get to saving faith here, you see it is um, accepting, receiving, and resting. Uh, and the same is uh, in the catechism. Um, accepting and accounting, well, that's God doing that. Receive and rest upon him alone for salvation. Uh, Shorty Catechism 86. So, faith acts upon evidence. And so, faith is to be given facts on the basis of a credible witness. And there must be a communication of facts, and that's how Dr. Smith uses the term faith is objective. That means it is. Uh, another word is uh, extra perspective. It's looking outside of itself. It's looking on a particular object. And that's the promises of God wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And so in our gospel, beginning of faith is a person knows the basics of who God is, of who the person himself is as a sinner, of what God has done in Christ and the promise. We also refer to that as the general call of the gospel. They also need to know the law of God. Uh, so they'll come to a point where they recognize that they need this Savior, that they are the sinners of which the Bible speaks. Um, 
So facts must be communicated. But you can communicate facts all day long. And that doesn't mean you can convince a person of the truth of those facts, right? So knowledge is merely, there must be a body of truth that's communicated for faith to take hold of. But that is only the, this initial step. Second then must be the assent to the truthfulness of the facts on the basis of the credible witness. So I tell you, same initiatives, that there is a street in Belo Horizonte where the ball rolls up the hill. And I've seen it. Or I can tell you that in the Southern Hemisphere, there's different constellations uh, than we have here. Now, you've never, never heard that before and you've never seen it, you didn't say that thing, but if I'm a reputable witness to you, you can say, well, I, I haven't seen that myself, but Piper says it, and so I believe it. Uh, now, the first is an optical illusion, but it's still a very convincing optical illusion. <laughs> um, but, um, and so the second part of, of saving faith then is this assent that yes, what God has said is true. And Dr. Smith adds, and that I must have some emotional connection to that, that it's good for me. It's true. It's true for me. It's true. It's good for me. Now, unfortunately, people, a lot of Reformed people stop right here. Because after all, we know doctrine. We know the catechism. We know the Bible. We know the facts. Trusting doctrine doesn't save you. Confessing the truth of the gospel doesn't save you. That's why it says, believe from the heart, the totality of our being, then must trust. Primary Hebrew word, batak, trust. Our uh, word for faith in the Bible comes from the word persuaded. So the Puritans used to say, roll yourself on Jesus. I get a little more modern. I say, you come in from a hard day's work, you go into your bedroom, and you throw yourself on the bed with no reservation. You abandon yourself to your bed. Faith is abandon yourself to Christ. Throw yourself on Him. You have no hope apart from Him. So all three of those elements need to be in faith. So when I ask you on your examination, give me the three elements of saving faith, this is what I want you to be able to do. Okay? Now, can weak faith save? That's the next question. Uh, Joseph Hombach, have you had a question yet? Okay, this is paragraph three. This faith is different in degrees, weak or strong, may be often and may in many ways assail and weaken, but gets the victory, growing up in many to the attainment of full assurance through Christ, who is both the author and finisher of our faith. Is it the strength of faith that saves us, or is it the act of faith that saves us? That sounds like a trick question. Mm. The, the faith itself didn't save you. Hmm? The faith that did itself right. didn't save you. So when weak or strong, neither one, in neither case, of the safe faith. No, it's not that kind of trick, trick question. <laughs> I'm using faith as the instrument okay. now, so. As the instrument, it doesn't matter whether it's a strong instrument or a weak instrument. Okay. The strength of faith is not what makes faith effective. And so that man, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Yes, the weak belief is sin, but uh, he, he stretched out that trembling hand and he took hold of Christ. The Sarah Phoenician woman had a strong faith. You know, she wouldn't take no for an answer. But both of them received uh, the glorious freedom from demonic possession of the children that they sought. And so we don't personally have to measure his faith. And, and once you've got this level of faith, you can come to Christ. Or, and we're going to come back to this later today, um, saving faith does not mean that the person has full assurance. Strong faith will reach full assurance. But there might be the bare hope, yes, I believe if, that God is, is, is able to save me if I trust Him and I'm trusting Him. And there's some modicum there of, of, uh, of confidence, not a lot. And that's the person that will wrestle. Uh, yes, ma'am. 
In one hour. I, so how let these two have equal time then. <laughs> how, how do you balance that pastorally? It's somebody who's struggling with assurance, but might also be unconverted. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's. Is that an, um, yeah. is that no, it's not. Insurance? That's the kind of questions I like. Oh, okay. you're, 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 you're winning a place. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess my, my question is also along those same lines. At what point do you um, pastorally rebuke or correct someone with little faith? Um, which is, you know, Jesus rebuked the disciples for their little faith. Mm -hmm. um, so at what point pastorally? Well, you, you don't, let's don't use the word rebuke. You are encouraging them to use the means to strengthen their faith and to seek from God stronger faith. Yeah, we, we should not let in ourselves or anyone else be content with weak faith or with a lack of assurance. We get to that chapter, we actually are obligated to seek assurance. And so, yeah, but we won't rebuke them. That doesn't help little faith because Christ didn't um, quench the smoldering wick, you see. <clears throat> the bruised reed and break. So that's a particular person who's going to need tender pastoral care. Uh, but they cannot be left alone in that. They've got to be challenged that um, they're dishonoring God when they don't uh, believe his promises. And God trains our faith then too. And that, that's part of that's we'll talk tomorrow in chapel about Lord willing about trials and what's God doing? He's, he's training your faith. And just as our Savior had his faith trained through the sufferings so that it was by being trained through sufferings that he was able to go to the cross. He wasn't ready for that at 20, even at 30. You see, he was being trained. He always had perfect faith, but he still had faith was being trained now for the greatest trial ever. And so our faith also will be trained, and people have to recognize then in their trials and sufferings, God is actually uh, working me over. He's training me um, for what's to come. So if we flee discomfort now and we sing shine, shine Jesus Shine and we live this superficial Christian life, when persecution comes, uh, we'll be very ill-equipped. All right. I don't think I've answered my question. Hmm? I said I'm going to answer your question. Oh, okay. Sorry. When we get to assurance. Okay. I thought that anyway. Okay. So. All right. So, any questions about faith? Another thing to keep in mind when we come back to assurance is this: faith must always then have the revelation of God's word. You see that in, in the way it's laid out there in that second paragraph. It's not some feeling. It's not what somebody else tells me. And that's what they tell me is the promise or commandment or threatening of Scripture. So faith always must have the testimony of God in order to be true faith and to act truly. So the trajectory of faith is Is that in your experience? Yeah. Yeah, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how, that's how I really know it is. Yeah, so there will be ebbs and flows. Dr. Piper? Yes. If the sacraments uh, help to increase and strengthen our faith, why do we not make more regular use of the Lord's Supper? Why do churches partake of that so infrequently? Very good question. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about the sacraments, but I can tell you right now, I've become convinced of weekly communion. So, um, not that it's required, but for the very thing you said. And the main thing you hear is, "Well, you'll take it for granted." Well, what part of the Christian worship don't we take for granted? Does your mind ever wander during the sermon, or during the singing, or during the praying? Um, yeah, it's it's our responsibility not to take anything for granted that God has given to us. But that's no excuse for not 
properly preparing our hearts to take this wonderful means of strengthening faith. And probably one of the reasons that we have so much weak faith is we, you know, when I was ordained, churches only had communion every quarter. And a group of us young men were the ones that first moved it to uh, monthly. And uh, then others came along, and I was a bit resistant at first. And part of the reason is that you have to need a mature congregation. That if you push weekly communion to a congregation that wants to be out of there in one hour, then you're going to give short shrift to everything else, the preaching and the liturgy. And so, so what I used to say in the worship course was that if you had mature congregation, but now I've changed that, and your goal is to have a mature congregation that can enjoy the Lord's Supper weekly. They, they trying to do it weekly at uh, Shiloh, aren't they? I know Matt does it weekly. They're, they're heading that direction. Yeah. We do it um, every two weeks. Okay. Well, every yeah. other week, yeah. Of course, they didn't always have ordained people before, but... Yeah. but uh, Child Heritage also. Yeah, also heading that direction, yeah. but not able to do it. Okay, all right. Can I ask you a practical question about that? Everybody? Yes, please. Um, what do you think about doing it morning and evening, which is a practice in both of those congregations every other week? Do you, do you like doing That's it? What I, well, what I recommend, now, I first experienced it when it really had a powerful uh, spiritual impact on me was I was supplying the... Uh, uh, Covenant Church in Douglasville when John Payne went down to uh, Charleston to do the church plant. I was over there 10 months. They had weekly communion and I was there for 10 months and I did so well spiritually with that frequency that um, but it was a great service. They never put the clock on my preaching. Uh, the liturgy was full uh, but they alternated morning and evening. Now what I've normally pastorally recommended is do the morning say on the first Sunday of the month. And then the evening, you're going to have fewer visitors uh, and a mature congregation than do the rest of the weekly communion. But it's something for the elders to work out what's best pastorally in the situation. Where they are. Any, any of y'all in churches that have weekly communion? We were. We were. Hmm. That was one of the things that they did well. Although they dipped the bread. <laughs> and that was the, aptly summarizes that church. And they didn't have others serving it, but <laughs> yeah, dipped, that's true. dipped your own, huh? Except the fondue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> what about doing the Lord's Supper twice on a Sunday in the morning and evening service, or is that every just week. every week? Yeah. Um, theoretically, that's what Calvin argued for, although he never really argued for it. He simply said that it should be in every service, but he preached twice on Lord's Day. I think that, uh, again, we do want to show that distinction, the primacy of the preached word. And so I like to keep that uh, uh, a distinction. The word's the primary means of grace. The sacraments are adjuncts to the word. And so... Um, but I don't know that biblically there's be a reason to or not to. You just that's where you do tend to begin to start shorten things and get into that Episcopal uh, Matins idea. We were gonna we'll come here and have a ten minute homily and take the supper and go home or something. So you have to really guard that. Good. Well, you guys are quiet out there. Could have asked Sean about heritage. Yeah, maybe they changed their practice since I was. Matt did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you're going to give him a smiley face. <laughs> Matt needs two smiley faces. Whoa! <laughs> I think that's a bit excessive. <laughs> All right. So let's move on now to repentance. Chapter 15, we want to consider, generally speaking, what is the role of faith in conversion, 
justification, salvation. So paragraph one, repentance unto life is an evangelical grace. And what would that mean? I guess I could, Mr. Horner. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to say, since it's an evangelical grace, that it is a gift of God. All right. You have redeemed yourself very well. Thank so, you. <laughs> so it is a gift of God. Uh, Larger Catechism 76 is a saving grace, uh, as the same as Shorter Catechism 87. Um, pastorally, Paragraph 1, the doctrine whereof is to be preached by every minister of the gospel as well as that of faith in Christ. And then paragraph 3, although repentance be not to be rested in as any satisfaction for sin or any cause of the pardon thereof, which is the act of God's free grace in Christ, yet it is of such necessity to all sinners that none may expect pardon without it. So, it's not the instrument of justification, but by necessity, and there's a very important distinction that you guys will get in logic. Right? Some of you had logic last semester, right? People started, anyway. The difference in, uh, I'm probably not getting exact terms, but an efficient cause and a necessary cause, that uh, there, there's some causes that create the thing, and there's some causes without which it would not exist. I think uh, Voss in his dogmatics makes a distinction between it takes the, the, the act of a father and mother to create a, a baby, but a safe birth will depend upon other necessary things of, 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 of air, oxygen, light, things like that that are an important part of a safe birth, necessary for a safe birth. But, and so in this way, repentance is necessary. Baptism is necessary. Uh, they're necessary because God has revealed them as means that he's going to use and apart from which uh, we cannot expect salvation. But faith is the alone instrument of our, I mean, yeah, of our uh, justification. Dr. Piper. Yes. This, this is Sean. Yes, I, I recognize like that melodious voice. <laughs> in um, uh, BD's the Presbyterian Standards, I like how he put it that he said that faith relates to the guilt of sin and repentance to its heinousness. Hmm. Say that again. Faith relates to the guilt of sin and repentance to its heinousness. Okay. Hmm. Let's put that, put that on the pot to simmer when we come here and talk about these aspects of repentance. And um, see if it, if it will measure up at that point. Now, it's to be preached as part of the gospel. So, you're from a wide range of congregations. Uh, what... To what degree are preachers today preaching repentance and the importance of repentance? Not just in the gospel presentation, but in daily living. All right, good. Is it a common experience for all of you that have been in better than average churches for the last few years? In Miami, no. In Miami, no. Well, I know what you're under here. <laughs> I would say every service. Oh, yes. At least your father-in-law. No, my father. Right. Your father is your wife's father-in-law. <laughs> Tim? Uh, yes, sir. It's been preached faithfully in my own Good. Life. Good. It's interesting they had to put this here that many years ago, and, and it's a perennial problem. Uh, this, uh, now, just as faith has three aspects that are tied to the faculties, so we got knowledge, um, assent, and trust. So repentance also has three aspects. And in paragraph two, 
by it a sinner out of the sight and sense not only of the danger, but also the filthiness and odiousness of his sins, as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God, and upon the apprehension of his mercy in Christ to such as are penitent, so grieves for and hates his sin as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. So what would be the three aspects here of repentance? Come in, sir. Hope you got your yeah. furniture. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So next week, you're to give a two-minute summary of Shorty Catechism 69 and 71. Yeah, you. Everybody else has already had their assignment. So. It's not just you're by yourself. So. And I really want you to review all those, but be prepared to help us with that summary. Okay, so what's the first aspect here? Oh, really? Well, apprehension of mercy, I guess, first. Oh, really? He grieves. <laughs> oh, really? Wouldn't it be knowledge again? Oh, who's that? <laughs> Caleb, very good. Flash your face on the, on the wall there for me again. So. You only get a smiley face because the rest of us are wrong. <laughs> He doesn't need a smiling face. Look at that. <laughs> Dabby-esque beard. I mean, this guy's got it. All right. A sinner out of the sight and sense, not only of the danger, but the filthiness and hatefulness, odiousness of sins is contrary to holy nature and righteousness. So this also begins with a realization of the heinous nature of sin. But Sean, I wanted to hold off because this surely is talking about guilt too, isn't it? Not only the danger, but also the filthiness and odiousness of sin. So yes, uh, of course it's hard to separate faith and repentance at this point as well, you understand. Because faith does see my guilt. Repentance is aware of my danger because of that guilt. So I'm not sure I want to make that distinction, but what do you think after I've said this? Um, I certainly uh, would agree that um, with you that it's uh, repentance is always uh, coupled with faith, um, and um, and they both obviously reference to sin. Um, it, it still seems to fit what BD was saying. Um, I didn't necessarily see a, something that you said that would not go hand in hand with it. Well, does not repentance see the danger, which would be the guilt of sin? That's all I'm asking. Oh, sure. Okay. So then to make that, that faith responds to guilt and repentance to grief or odiousness, that's, that's where I'm quibbling with you a bit. What's the second knowledge that one must have? Sin that he agrees with God that it is sin. No, the second knowledge. Yeah, he, he does that, but we're not talking about a sin here. We're talking still about the first one, about knowledge. Contrary to the nature of God. All right, I would put that under uh, it's, yeah, all of this, the nature of sin. So we said the nature of sin, that's the first object of knowledge, the nature of sin. And how about uh, salvation? And then the apprehension of the mercy of, what wonderful words. That's true repentance. That's the difference in Peter and Judas. Judas had already been warned. He had no hope of mercy of God in Christ. And so he, in despair, kills himself. Peter, who had been told that you'll be restored and you will then comfort your brothers, and he got that look from Christ. What a look. In the midst of all of his suffering, the Savior could look with compassion on Peter pierced his heart to the core. He went out and wept bitterly. But there was an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ. And so, and you can see here that saving faith and repentance are just all intertwined so that uh, 
yes, God tells me in his word that he's offered me hope in Christ. And I'm believing that. And I believe what the Bible says about me and the danger and the odiousness of sin. So it's important uh, that uh, we begin again with uh, uh, knowledge that our sins are against God and that there's mercy in Christ. And then the affections. So we grieve and hate sin. So he grieves for and hates his sin. So here is that holy hatred that will grow in in our sanctification. If you look back to when those of you like me were converted from the world, you look back how much more sorrow you have now for sin than you had then. And the more we grow in grace, the more our sorrow, even for the sins of our youth, you find the psalmist, you know, uh, don't hold the sins of my youth against me. He knew he was pardoned, but he was overwhelmed again with the serious nature of, of his sin. And so uh, we should have this grief and hatred. And then the third part is the volitional. He turns from them all to God, purposing and endeavoring constantly to walk with him in all the ways of new obedience. It's new obedience because it's obedience now out of a new heart. But there is resolve now, you see. And this is the fruit of repentance of which Scripture speaks, that uh, um, repentance bears this uh, uh, good good fruit. Doctor, I have a question or a comment uh -huh. on this part. Oh, this is Caleb again. Hey, Caleb um, again. In Christian's Great Interest by Guthrie, yeah. he talks about um, some are drawn without a conscious preparatory work of the law. And I thought that was a pretty interesting thing just to maybe talk about with this, this topic, that there isn't necessarily a distinct um, moment of, I need to repent, I'm a sinner. You know, there's people who are raised in the church and never have that particular experience, but maybe would have that happen throughout their life. Is that worth talking about? That would be one thing. He's probably also addressing uh, the idea that you have to go through a distinct law work before you can right. come to Christ, rather than a conviction of sin. So I think there must always be a conviction of sin. But some of the, particularly the New England Puritans, uh, tried to quantify everything. And so you had to go through a, a, all your steps. Uh, and so you had to go through a period of a law work before you could come to Christ. And that's what I think Guthrie's arguing against. No, you must have conviction of sin. There's no coming, why come to Christ if you don't know? That's different now from the covenant child who has been regenerated and they simply are growing in their knowledge of the beauty of Christ and their own sin. There's always sin there though. I mean, if any of you, have, I know my wife, that's, she made a profession of faith at 12 in a Baptist church, but she, as far as she knew, um, uh, she'd always rested in Christ, but she came to a, a greater sense of her need of a Savior at that point, and that is what God's going to do in a covenant child as well. But there must, for the person coming from the world, there must be some conviction of sin. It's just you can't quantify it. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's that's basically exactly what I was trying to get at with that. I think that's a helpful thing to uh, talk about here. All right, good. And so then, um, desiring to walk, that's the fruit of repentance then. So again, if a person is really repentant, they are going to desire to obey. They're not going to want to live in sin. They wrestle with sin. But that's bringing forth the, the fruit of repentance. Also, um, paragraph 4. As there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, so there's no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. And again, in the Bible Belt, people need to hear the first thing. That uh, I'll often speak to children, and I'll say, you know, if you've only ever told one little lie, one time you got really angry with your brother or your sister, that is sufficient for you to go to hell. You don't have to be a 
adulterers and homosexuals and murderers and perverts. But the other hand, this is so good that uh, there's no sin so great. And so I direct people to the tension of Adam, who slayed the whole human race, and Manasseh. Because of Manasseh's sin is why Israel was carried away into exile. And yet you read in Chronicles that in his 90s, I guess, he was converted. And you tell sinners that, said, you know, Satan whispers in your ear, you've sinned too long and too hard. God saves sinners. And if you will come to God in Christ, he will accept you. So that, that's a, a very glorious and, and balanced uh, statement. And then a paragraph, any questions about that paragraph? Paragraph 5 deals with the difference between general and particular repentance. Men ought not to content themselves with a general repentance, but it is every man's duty to endeavor to repent of his particular sins particularly. So, no, Jonathan Monty, you're not here, are you? You're not am I? No. All right, uh, David Melton, what does that mean? Mike might be muted, David. I don't know. It's on, but I, we can't hear you. But it doesn't say it's muted either. Hmm. Okay. So, Vinicius, what does that mean? means that if we commit a particular sin, it does not, we just not ask God for a general forgiveness, but we confess that sin. Okay. So that what we're praying for, what we're looking for, is for God to bring to mind our sins. <clears throat> that we might repent of them individually. Now, we'll never remember all of our sins. I remember as a very zealous uh, papist, always worrying. I, I know I'm going to mess this list up, you know. Uh, no. So one of the things we repent of is our repentance. <laughs> well, I know I've repented poorly. I know that my repentance is marked with sin. But you should, again, have this time of examination where... As you go to bed at night or first thing in the morning, you look back on the previous day and uh, consider uh, those particular sins uh, and uh, then repent of them particularly. So again, we're talking about a work of grace here. We're talking about laboring the Christian faith. We're not drifting in, in the Christian faith. Now that relates to particular confession. So the next paragraph, as every man is bound to make private confession of his sins to God, praying for the pardon thereof, upon which, and the forsaking of them, he shall find mercy. So again, as if we're repenting particularly, we're going to confess those individual sins. But what we're asking God to do is to give us broken hearts uh, over those sins, uh, grief and hatred of those sins, desire to put away those sins. And to plead with God for mercy for Christ's sake. I think most of us probably are pretty deficient here at this particular uh, level of our Christian experience. And so that he that scandalizeth his brother of the church of Christ ought to be willing by a private or public confession and sorrow for his sin to declare his repentance to those that are offended who are thereupon to be reconciled to him and in love to receive him. So if you know that you've sinned against your brother, your sister, your child, your neighbor, a fellow church member, then you have a responsibility to go and ask forgiveness. And they have a responsibility when you ask forgiveness to grant that uh, forgiveness. And that's how we maintain peace and unity in the body of Christ. And then there will be those public sins that have 
brought scandal to the name of Christ, and that will entail then public confession before the church. And so in those really grievous sins of an outward nature, uh, one needs to stand before the church and either have written out and read it or make uh, extemporaneous, thoughtful, uh, sometimes before the session, but a, a, a sin of which the congregation is aware, then it needs to be uh, confessed in that way as well. And then, of course, our, those of us who have the privilege of being in churches with weekly confession of sin, and Calvin deals with that in the uh, Institutes, that we don't, uh, you know, it's a glorious privilege to be able as well publicly in God's presence, but we need also with that, it's not just emotion to which we're going, we need to stir up our hearts, and whether it's a common prayer or a free prayer, to be engaged and seeking God to give us repentance even as we make this public confession. Yes, sir. I have a question on that. Um, and I, I've never asked this even to my pastor before, but it, it always has bothered me that our public confession of sin is so short. Um, meaning, uh, sorry, not public, private confession in public worship. Oh. Um, it, it seems like every church that I've been to, they leave maybe 30 seconds to a minute to get all your sins confessed. Um, and I have always felt, from a, even from the time I was a child, that that's just not enough time. And I don't know if that's just me, and I have too much sin. Well, <laughs> no, because you shouldn't be waiting until the public service to confess your sin. Right. Yeah, so no. I think at this point, it's particularly the sins that have been brought to mind. This is why it's important to have some reading of God's law. Sure. A lot of our churches here will have public confession, no reading of the law. So, appointed reading of the law with some uh, explication of that, and that's where we should focus. The sure. rest of your confession you should have already done before you... And some of the churches are not going to have any time in private. It's going to simply be a common prayer, and that's fine. It should be addressed to the particular needs as we as a congregation. And remember, it's, it's more of a congregational confession at this point than individual. So what, well, because I, 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 told, I definitely agree with that, but what would be the point then of private confession in public worship? Um, Probably not a great deal. <laughs> because you're saying it's not just about the motions of doing it right. it's about genuine so it would be if there are particular sins out of this opening up of God's law that's come to your mind that go beyond that which has been prayed for publicly you might want to do that but it's not a time of your confession but it should relate and I think it's pastor who a better job but it should relate to what's going on in this service even during the sermon Holy Spirit convicting you of sin, you should repent. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I've, I've been in churches where they use private confession before uh, the sacrament of communion. Um, would you encourage that? Or would that disrupt the, the order and flow of the uh, worship service? Yeah, again, you know, our catechism is quite clear. We should have come prepared. So, if we're rightly instructing our people how to prepare for the Lord's Supper, that should not be a need. So I wouldn't do that. What if you have guests in the church? Well, all right, then we get into whom we allow to come to the table. We'll deal with that when we come to the Lord's Supper then. Is that what you're asking? You're asking about confession. Yeah, I'm just saying, if, if, you know, if a known believer comes, like, I visited churches around here, I don't know that the Lord's Supper is going to be being served. So I appreciate the time that they give, you know, before. Um, well, you should have time before the service begins if you're there at an, at an apt time to make sure yeah. your heart's prepared there. But once we've moved into the uh, service itself with the institution and the Lord's Supper and, and, uh, and such, um, the table address should also convict of sin as well as the joy of coming to the table. Uh, I have one question regarding going back to repentance and uh, the comment that was made earlier that the law should have had some, some work in that person's heart. Um, what if there are, and I'm thinking uh, tangibly of experiences that I've had in Miami, where people believe that, there's, that they are truly converted, but they've never actually wrestled with sin. Or there's been zero to little wrestling with uh, sin, they just know that they need a savior, um, and so it almost seems like a mental. Decision. How would you 
A savior from what? Well, I want to see them grow in their grief over sin. So I think I would, uh, I mean, I would examine the foundations. Are you resting in Christ? And why are you resting in Christ? And what does that mean in your life? And what kind of sorrow do you have for your sin? And then, you know, we daily are to be growing in this sorrow and hatred of sin. Do you still love sin? Then it's a possibility, a very strong possibility you're not converted. If you've got a growing uh, hatred and dislike of sin, then you need to seek God to cultivate that in you. So they maybe at the beginning didn't, but they can't have be a Christian life and have no repulsion about sin. Sadly, Paul says lot. that in Ephesians 5, doesn't he? Sadly, there's a, a lot of people that, that I've come across where 20 years Christian and they yeah. don't have any remorse for no, I, you know, I would say as a pastor, 20 years as a Christian and no pursuit of sanctification, no remorse for sin, that I would question their conversion. That's a delicate issue to approach because then they get defensive. And, yeah. And so when the doctor wants to tell you you've got terminal cancer if you don't cut it out, that's a very delicate issue. Remember what God says to Ezekiel. If you don't tell them and they die in their sin, you... Their blood is on you. If you do tell them they die in their sin, and we want to be pastoral and prayerful and gentle, but people got to hear this. Um, it's only for their well-being. And you can, I mean, you say, you know, it appears to me that if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, you really need to, to question your conversion and go to First John because there's the marks. Do you hate sin and do you love righteousness? Do you love God? Do you love His Word? Do you love the brother? And then uh, get into what hate, sin, and, and love righteousness means. Sometimes they do, they don't know how to express it. And we're, we're all different emotionally too. And so they might be thinking of grief and sorrow in a way that they're emotionally just not wired to express. Um, and so they're much less, what's the word, phlegmatic? They'd be more phlegmatic. And um, so again, we have to be careful how we look at those emotions. But just from my experience, I think a lot of evangelical preaching got more people repenting of the consequences of sin, and not mm -hmm. so much of the sin and the God that's been offended. Yeah. No, I think that's true. David, you just stretching those fingers? Stretching those fingers. Stretch your golf fingers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep that ready, huh? All right. Well, let's take a five-minute break. And we'll get back to perseverance, assurance, and we'll start on the wall. We'll do it. Okay. Uh, anything else on repentance and confession? They do go together. Repentance should always lead to confession. Confession grows out of repentance. All right. We'll go to perseverance, which is chapter 17. Kenneth, why do you think the confession talks about perseverance and not preservation? Well, because we're united with Christ that um, we can't fall away from the state of grace totally, but we will persevere in the meaning that we will grow in grace and in holiness of, to okay. one degree or another. So our neighbors around here that say once saved, always saved, uh, that's true. But how do you know if you've once been saved? You persevere. David. Thank you. Okay, so uh, paragraph one. They whom God hath accepted in his beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit. Again, these couplets are so important. They, they, one chapter grows out of previous chapters. So now we've got accepted in his beloved. There's the atonement, effectually called sanctified by his spirit and that I think that particularly is looking at definitive sanctification as well as progressive 
can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. So you see how it puts the two things together. Can never finally fall away, but shall certainly persevere. And so it's not that I am simply saved and regardless of what I do, um, I'm saved. No, if I have been accepted in the beloved, effectually called and sanctified, then I'm going to persevere. Now, notice again the people to whom this grace applies, the threefold, accepted in Christ, effectually called, and being sanctified in the Spirit. And the promise is, will not fall away, but will persevere. So he has begun a good work and you will bring it to completion. Same chapter, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you to will and do his good pleasure. Heaven is entered into by endurance. And again, we've had an overreaction to stuff like federal vision and a simplification of the Christian life. Covenant keeping includes obedience. Not for justification, but if we're going to keep the covenant. If we have been saved, we're going to, what does God say to Abraham? Walk before me and be blameless. And that must be then the tenor and direction of our life. Now, paragraph two roots this uh, in very important grounds, David. This perseverance of the David Rios of saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election, flowing from the free and changeable love of God the Father, upon the efficacy of the merit intercession of Jesus Christ, the abiding of the Spirit, the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace, um, from all which ariseth also the certainty and infallibility thereof, and then larger catechism, true believers by reason of the unchangeable love of God, his decree and covenant to give them perseverance, and their inseparable union with Christ, his continual intercession for them and the spirit and the seed of God abiding in them can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace but are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So what are some of the grounds, Mr. Rios? Okay. Okay, so then we go over to the catechism for that. So we got um, uh, the, well, flowing from the free, and then the catechism says the unchangeable love of God and his decree. Yeah. All right. Um, the uh, efficacy of merit and intercession of Jesus Christ. All right. And that's tied into union with Christ. Um, there's the abiding of the Spirit. Um, and the seed of God. What's the seed of God? Huh? Uh, no. It's that core of the new nature that is planted within us. That um, he's renewed our will so that we want to walk in. Is that the same thing as what the first Peter talked about? Yeah. And the nature of the covenant of grace. Very important to note that. Um, the covenant of grace runs straight through here. There was a, a previous. Uh, and I failed at that point to pick up on, I was going to pick up on that, I think it was from faith. Um, yeah, at the very end of, of the definition of faith, uh, paragraph two, by virtue of the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace, God has brought us into this covenant um, and it's by faith We've entered into the covenant by faith. We remain in the covenant. But it's because of this covenant that uh, God has saved us and going to keep us. And the covenant then contributes with its promises to our assurance of salvation. All right. Very good. Um, and then it ends with that the infallible nature of this perseverance. Completely certain because it depends on God and not man. So again, we see the importance of doctrine. These are doctrines that bolster the Christian life. 
And we cannot separate living the Christian life from these great foundational doctrines in the Bible. And all these doctrines, as faith takes hold of these various things, uh, are means to, are being strengthened to persevere, but also to grow in assurance of our salvation. Then we have a warning in paragraph uh, three, Andrew. Nevertheless, they made through the temptations of Satan and the world and the prevalency of the corruption in them. So we think about the, the world, the flesh, and Satan, the troika of temptation, often joined together in a deadly combination. And we always have our flesh, the remaining of corruption within us. Uh, Satan can tempt that, can tempt us itself, as James says. Satan can use the world to stir up lust within us, and he himself can stir the pot. And so uh, we may, through the temptations of Satan, and we have Satan, this is all the demons, they all tempt, and the world, the prevalency of corruption remain in them. But notice this, and neglect of the means of their preservation fall into grievous sins, and for a time continue therein whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened, and their consciences wounded, hurt, scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. So, uh, why do you think this warning is in here, Mr. Rios? Okay, it is a reality. Um, that we must never forget that we live in uh, this pressure cooker of temptation. Now that's, that's the reality of the Christian life. So what did I say in chapel a couple of weeks ago? That uh, there's three things, sir, not just tackles and death, that the Christian will have a daily struggle against sin. So the factor then is the neglect of what? The means of grace. The means of preservation. So if we grow cold and slack in our private devotions and particularly in attending to public worship, uh, in heeding the Spirit speaking to us through His Word and making careful use of the sacraments, uh, we're not going to have the grace to withstand temptation because these are means of strength. Go back to what's necessary to escape the wrath and curse of God well, we saw that it was faith, repentance, and the diligent use of the outward means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of his mediation. So does that mean that, um, according to Hebrews, it would say we can slide back into spiritual intimacy? Well, uh, yes and no. You can come to a point where you barely show signs of life. But uh, when you repent, you're not going to still be at that, at that stage. Although, I can assure you, coming out is a lot harder than going in. Um, declension is very easy. Uh, coming out of declension is uh, very difficult. And so we don't, don't play lightly uh, with these things. So God in his sovereign wisdom will allow falls into very grievous sins and even the continuation therein. So David was in his sin for at least how long? A year. A year. Uh, and he hardened his heart as it says here. Uh, he had God's displeasure. He grieved the spirit. Uh, he was obviously, in his, he says in Psalm 32, he was deprived of measures of graces, comforts, um, and temporal judgments, both in his own body uh, and in the death of uh, the child. Um, so it is a very sobering warning that it can happen. Uh, it's going to happen to many people whom you know. It can happen to some of you, probably has happened to some of you. It can be grievous and shocking sins. I mean, it, you know, David committed adultery, a minister can commit adultery, an elder can commit adultery, a young person can commit fornication. Um, doesn't mean it's the end of the day. A lot depends on whether this was a sudden temptation and fall and immediate repentance or hardening themselves in that sin for a period of time. So in 
The PCA and the OPC, there's a minimum of one year suspension from the ministry. That's minimum. And then the court must make a decision. Was this uh, a hardened, uh, repeated practice of sin, or was this a sudden temptation and fall that was immediately forsaken? Uh, one man may perhaps be remitted to the ministry, but the other one, if he continued in that for a period of time, he can still come to repentance. The consequences would be such that he would not be readmitted to, uh, to the ministry. So David, perfectly pardoned and forgiven, dealt with the consequences of that sin the rest of his life. And that also is very sobering to us. So God's displeasure should sober us much more than it does. Grieving the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? Um, Cobra, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? Um, it goes against God's will, and uh, I believe, practically speaking, that uh, if a Christian sins, uh, he feels bad after that sin. And well, maybe eventually, think, but not right here he doesn't. Does he? Yeah. <laughs> um, the Spirit, remember, the Spirit doesn't have emotions, but this is simply God's, so the Spirit hates our sin and will withdraw His presence so the other things happen. Then we're deprived of, of, of means of grace and comfort and have our hearts hardened because the Spirit is going to withdraw His uh, gracious influences in our lives for a period of time. And conscious hearts can be hardened as the children of Israel did in the wilderness. Uh, conscience is wounded, as was David's. Uh, and then what, the harm he did to others. That was part of David's, when, when he was rebuked, it was, it was the scandal that he caused the church. One of the reasons that he took the life of the child was the scandal that was caused in the name of God. And then, of course, temporal judgments. So, you know, some of those that died in Corinth were coming hypocritically to the Lord's table weren't eternally lost, but they were severely chastened uh, for abusing uh, the table of the Lord. So, can, will, if a person lives, will a true believer always return to the Lord in repentance? Yes. And this is the role, we'll talk later about church discipline, but this is the importance of church discipline because this is the God appointed means by which uh, people will be brought to repentance uh, but now here's another practical question then can a person who has backslidden and kills themselves be pardoned yes yes you think so <laughs> I mean, is anybody say no? Oh, well, good for you guys. That's, uh, anybody out there want to say no? After <laughs> I tip my hand? Okay. You see, to say that a person died with unconfessed sin means they couldn't be saved, you introduce works back into our relationship to God. And who of us is not going to die with unconfessed sin? It's just maybe not as serious a sin as self-murder. But uh, it's not our confession of sin. Repentance is necessary, but it is faith in Christ who justifies us. So um, if we don't make a judgment about a person's, uh, and I would recommend to you, did you hear Rick's sermon at the time, the, uh, the guy in the church killed himself? Well, Trey was my best friend, but uh, one of my best friends. Yeah. That's the reason why we ended that second. That's an excellent sermon on sermon audio. I don't remember, the, it was about five years ago. So, um, the um, well, Labor Day just happened, so five years ago. <laughs> but, do uh, you remember the text? Not exactly. Anyway, it was about five years ago, but it was an excellent sermon, um, difficult sermon uh, to, to, to preach. So, we got a lot of heat from the community because of it, too. Yeah. yeah. Which I knew was the reason why. Yeah, a bunch of them were there, and they were very offended by it, yeah. So, um, 
I'm glad y'all were sound on that. I don't even have to ring you out on that one. So, so that's okay. good. So counseling is practically counseling a family whose child has committed suicide. And at one point, have made a profession of faith. You would zero in on the profession of faith. Yes, if they're if they're a member in good standing in the church, I'm not going to be their judge. In fact, I'm not going to be anybody's judge. I'll leave them to the mercy of God. But if they've made a profession of faith and are in, in good standing, then uh, yes, they didn't lose their salvation because of this uh, act. A good friend of mine killed himself just two months ago, past OP pastor in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. He'd be the most happy, even go, easygoing, joyful guy you would ever know, <laughs> and had a year of depression. And I'm I'm very opposed to antidepressants, and I think they're often depressants and suicide often is a consequence not always i'm not saying that but he was on an antidepressant got worse and worse and um yeah so in fact the opc's had a number of uh ministers uh, commit suicide <coughs> and as far as the ones i knew of were all godly men a friend of mine pastor in new york city a few months ago was yeah, that just happened, what, in the last year, was it? Yeah, that was a shocker. Yeah. A he was young. Yeah. All right. Sobering, but uh, comforting? Yeah, it's the second hour. You can go. Okay. <laughs> a slightly different question, but about just the means of grace. Like, this seemed to be talking a little bit more about bigger sins, but... Um, so we talk a lot about how God works through his word and the preaching and mm -hmm. not neglecting these means. But then there's people like the rich young ruler who came to Christ and said, I followed all these commands. Or we have people in the Bible Belt who go to church and read their Bible but aren't saved. So what, pastorally, would you say is that distinction? Like how can a true Christian use those means or avail themselves of those means and know that they're doing it out of faith, I guess? When you go back to 1 John, you start with the marks. So if you have the marks of the one born of God, and you do this then in faith on God to use them, not because you're doing them mechanically, but because he will use them. And you use them by faith. Okay? I still see the question. No, I'm just processing all those. All right, you process. Thank you. Hannah, too. All right. That's, good. <laughs> that's a compliment. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, yes. This is Andrew. Before Hi, Andrew. Get away from this topic. I've just been thinking about when we looked at the sin of David. And in juxtaposition to David, we have, you know, we have David's confession, and it's pretty clear that David went through all of these kind of. Uh, outworkings of what this looks like but opposed to that we have Ahab who you know comparatively their sins you know, both had a man killed for something that they wanted to possess that belonged to the other man um, both are can you know their sins brought to their attention by the word of the Lord through prophets and Ahab's you know case it was Elijah but the two types of repentances are completely different right where Ahab's type of repentance is more like, unfortunately, more like one I can identify with in my own life. Uh, kind of, yeah, I, I'm afraid of the, the punishment, but no sense of, of the grievousness of it. Right. It's just, it's, that's interesting to me how I, I never really, you know, I was sitting Well, thinking, yeah, it's, it'd be like uh, Judas and Peter. So you've got one as a sin of remorse, and the other one's a sin of a broken heart. And Paul deals with that in First Corinthians, Second Corinthians seven, uh, yeah. the repentance that is not under life. In fact, I just photocopied that for the Christ and Salvation class. We didn't get there today, but Calvin on that section has got seven marks of true repentance. So if you look at that, it's Book Three, Repentance. For Second Corinthians seven. All right, well, you, uh, Jeremy, you've been so quiet tonight. You behaving? 
Third. Okay. You keeping Lou in line? We're trying to. You know that's hard. <laughs> okay. All right. Tell me, uh, Jeremy, can there be a presumptive assurance? Yes. All right. So the confession begins, although hypocrites and other unregenerate men. Now, those hypocrites are in that category of other unregenerate men. May vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presumptions of being in the favor of God and the estate of salvation, which hope of theirs shall perish. Now, their proof text is Matthew 7, uh, on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. But... Um, one of the proof texts that the, um, the writers would use, at least in discussion of this, is Isaiah 50, 50, Isaiah 50, 10. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. So here they're dealing with the issue that there can be one who fears the Lord who is lacking assurance. But then this is warning. Behold, verse 11, all you who kindle a fire who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze, this you will have from my hand, you will lie down in torment. So I think this fire is their self-assurance. But these are people who do not fear God. They walk according to their own light, and they're going to go to hell. They're going to lie down in torment. And so it's possible that there are those. In fact, in the Bible Belt, um, we have a lot of them uh, that I believe because they are in the church, they walked an aisle, they did whatever, uh, they believe the facts, that they are converted. When I was in Hungary, it was, it was exactly the same thing. Um, the Reformed Hungarian Church was almost like a state church. You talk to a person about salvation. Oh, yes, I was baptized in the Hungarian Reformed Church. It occurred to me then, the question to use there and here uh, is, uh, have you been born again? That will throw them completely off their game. And then what do you mean? Well, you know the story of Nicodemus. You know, he was a lot like you. But Jesus told him that he had to be born again. Have you been born again? Well, I don't know. Well, let me tell you how you can know. And so it's a whole new entrance with these people uh, to get them to be thinking about their uh, state before God. So this is a danger. But the danger, they start here because the danger is never to hinder the seeking, the desire, the certainty of a true believer for assurance. Because notice, yet, such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity, and endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him may in this life be certainly assured they are in the state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. So there is such an assurance, but how does he describe those to whom uh, this assurance would belong? Uh, go back to where are we here? Mr. Vogel. Where did you just read that? Paper? Second half of paragraph one, or the second two thirds of paragraph one. Okay. So, what's the contrast he's making? I'm sorry, we're on assurance, 18. Yes, okay. Yeah, 
Not eight, 18. There. There. You're there. Um, so the contrast is between um, that they may, may rejoice and not be ashamed. So who does this, to whom does this concept of assurance belong? All the elect. According to the paragraph, how do you know you're elect? This paragraph would give you signs. Right. What are they? That we have true hope that we re rejoice. Um, now let's start, yeah. The hope, the hope won't perish, but why? They believe in the Lord, they truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love Him in sincerity. Right. So we're really now talking about What's your relationship to Christ? What is his role in your life? And then how do you know if you truly believed and love him, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him? Let me go back to 1 John again. So what does it mean to walk in all good conscience before him? It's to have these marks. I hate sin. I love righteousness. I love God. I love the brethren. I love God's word. Um, so that's how we know if we have truly believed in Christ and love him sincerely. And it's a very important place uh, to start with this discussion of assurance. Now, question 80. Um, Mr. Blizzard uses the word infallible. How can true believers be infallibly assured that they're in a state of grace? What does that mean? I'll go back to chapter before we, we we know for sure because we're convicted of sin and what does infallible mean without um... so in other words these people are mistaken in their thinking does that mean that there's always the possibility that every one of us will be mistaken in his thinking about could be mistaken about assurance no what does infallible mean So an infallible assurance is an assurance without error. So it's 100% correct. That is uh, what is said here uh, before us so that um, we then can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. So uh, this belongs to all who are in Christ, who sincerely love him, who strive to walk in holiness, uh, and they can rejoice in this hope where the others have a false hope but that's not by special revelation, paragraph two, but the certainty, the truth of God's word. This certainty, another way of saying infallibility, is not a bare conjectural and probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith grounded upon the promises of salvation. So here's where we begin. The one who believes the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. These things that I have written that you may know that you have eternal life. Then the testimony, uh, the inward evidence of these graces under which these promises are made, that is uh, believing in Christ, loving him, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him. Uh, and in the testimony of the spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God. So that, as I said last week in the sermon, the spirit is pointing to the things he's doing because he's the author of the works. And he's bearing testimony with our own consciences that, yes, we're in Christ and we do love God. And so as you're dealing with someone uh, with assurance, now we'll go back to... Uh, this good question up here is do you assume that that person has been converted that's what you were asking a while ago right or kind of when they're questioning it you know, yeah well, you don't ever you always start as a good diagnostician and so you're going to begin tell me about your relationship to Christ and you're looking to find out you know are they uh, truly believing in Christ and sincerely loving 
So that's that's quite essential. And then you can actually tell them if you're convincing them that you know you couldn't do that if you were saved. Uh, this is a, this is very important. Uh, you would not want to love God. You wouldn't want to know God. You wouldn't want to have God as your father. But you also have to look at sin. Is there a particular practice of sin in your life? Uh, which would be doing what to the Holy Spirit? Grieving Him. Which would bring depression because of guilt. And so I have found as well at times that either depression or lack of assurance comes because the person has not properly dealt with sin or has dealt with sin but not properly accepted the pardon that can belong to them so they can have real guilt or they can have wrong guilt but you've got to deal with that and then you try to help them think through well look what can I do in your life you know you you love God we yeah I love God I just don't know that God loves me well if you love God the Bible says he loved you first <laughs> Uh, we look at these promises, we look at the reality, and then you're saying, now ask the Spirit, and you're asking the Spirit as well, to bear testimony uh, to you. You delight in the idea of being a child of God. And you want to pray. Uh, and these are the grounds then that are set out bef before us that every one of you needs to to use either with yourself or with others. So that's often a pastoral question on the examination. How would you deal with a person who lacks assurance? Is it appropriate for new believers who begin to early on struggle with assurance of faith and salvation to encourage them simply to wait for the Spirit to... No, not appropriate. It is inappropriate, though, to give them assurance. In the typical evangelistic method, you believe in Christ, now you know you're saved. No, that's not our job. Uh, I never questioned, I should have probably a hundred times, uh, my salvation. Never have wrestled, uh, really wrestled with assurance. I come closer now to wrestling with doubts and things than throughout my life. But uh, no, because it's often a company saving faith. But God's sovereign in that. So we don't caution them. We don't give it to them. I'm saying that someone, that they're... They, they, they make a profession of faith, but like shortly thereafter, they, they begin to really question if they're saved or not. I think a lot of like friends at college that all of a sudden they hear the Reformed Gospel for the first time, and they're living in sin, and they, they believe in this Gospel, but the sin doesn't instantly leave them, and so they wrestle with, I believe in this, but how do I know I believe because my whole childhood I thought I was believing, but I didn't really know. How do I know this is a genuine faith now, but there's still sin in my life? How would you pass well, that's them? where you take them to those marks. Do you want not to sin? Okay. Do you mourn when you sin? Do you want to obey God? Now, you're sinning and you need to let go of that sin. Mm -hmm. And if you are unwilling to let go of that sin, then that would mean you weren't converted. But if you're wrestling with the sin, then uh, you cast yourself on God's mercy. <clears throat> Good. Well, we're not going to go ahead tonight, are we? That's okay. <laughs> So, I want to talk about the relationship of assurance and saving faith, and that is paragraph 3A. I've got Mr. Vogel here, so he can argue if he wishes to do so. The follow assurance does not so belong to the essence of faith that a true believer may wait long in conflict with difficulties before he is made partaker of it. Um, and uh, Larger Catechism 81, assurance of grace and salvation not being of the essence of faith. And why did they add this, you think? Is it, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Quit, Brad. I was going to say, isn't it the Lutheran position that assurance is? How about the Calvin position? Mm -hmm. Okay. It was the first generation reformers. Are you going to add something, Anishas? Just say that you can have true faith don't have right. So, and you realize they were claiming the gospel in a context of Roman anti-assurance. And so they really <coughs> overstated the case. And so the true faith always had with it assurance of personal salvation. And the reason I emphasized a while ago that faith can only take hold of the promises of Scripture. I don't find my name there. Well, my name is there in a few places, but it's not my name. Um, <laughs> 
And so it doesn't say, Piper, you are a saved. No, it gives marks. It says, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. But now, have I truly believed in the Lord uh, Jesus Christ? So the early reformers made assurance, true saving faith had full assurance. Now that's pretty much stated in the Heidelberg Catechism. Whereas in the Canons of Dort, Canons of Dort sound like Westminster. That you can have your assurance shaken uh, or diminished or, and, and such. So um, that's what this means when it's not of the essence of faith. Daddy makes a distinction, assurance of faith and assurance of hope. You must have an assurance of faith. And that is, God has promised that anybody who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And I believe that. I'm absolutely certain that God keeps that promise. But now, may I surely apply that to myself. And that's where people uh, can be without assurance. Do you want to respond? No. I, I agree with everything you say. I, I would say... The question for someone questioning their assurance is not is it not so much um, can I lose my salvation as much as it is can God lose one of the children? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Well, very good. So that's why that's here. Uh, and true believers may wait long before they obtain it, or as the confession says, they may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God. He may without extraordinary revelation. So this is, again, uh, you get into the hyper-Calvinism and the Netherlands reform and all that, where you've got to have some lighting breakthrough. No, without extraordinary revelation, and the right use of ordinary means attained thereunto. So there again, right use of ordinary means. It's the means of grace. And therefore, it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election. Sure, that's a commandment, isn't it? In First Peter, Second Peter 1. And that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost and love and thankfulness to God and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness. So they address a number of things here. Uh, one is that one may not have full assurance. Second, that uh, everyone has a duty, though, to seek full assurance by using the means that God has as given, that their hearts may be enlarged in peace. And then it addresses as well the uh, false accusation, reason that Rome kept back assurance. Actually, it was the pocketbook, but they said this would promote uh, sin. And, and it's just the opposite, you see. That uh, thankfulness to God and strength and cheerfulness and duties of obedience the proper fruits of this assurance. So far, is it from inclining men to looseness? So God grants enlarged peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And the heart is enlarged with love and thankfulness. That is an obedience and thus there will be perseverance and not looseness of living. That's really what we have there in the second half of paragraph 3. Now the loss of assurance is paragraph 4. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation divers ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted. So you could have it and lose it. Uh, and this gets the same thing with, with perseverance. How? By negligence and preserving of it. Again, not using the means of grace. By falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit. The backslidden person will not lose their salvation, but they should lose their assurance. By some sudden or vehement temptation, which I referred to, God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness. That's Isaiah 50.10. And yet they are never utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith, the love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, and by the which, in the meantime, they are supported from utter despair. So you might have to begin with them with repentance. You know, why have you lost your assurance? Uh, and you don't just hurry back to assurance. Now, you know, are you broken over this sin? Have you confessed it? Will you confess it? And they do that, and then you point these things in their life, so that you know these are only products of the work of the Spirit. 
And so it's, it's very important to focus on uh, love of Christ, life of faith and the brethren, love of the brethren, sincerity of heart, etc. So again, we see the practicality of uh, the standards and of doctrine uh, in all of the Christian life. Well, that's okay. Uh, we're not going to move ahead tonight, and probably won't next week with our discussion of the law. Sense of knowledge, yeah. Huh? Sense of knowledge, she's here. Well, actually, she behaved quite well. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have that. Oh, we do. That's right. Oh, it's a good my. thing you have. <laughs> there you go. I am on track. Oh, no, no, no. Boy, thank you. You're so tired. No, but it's been lovely. I'm very happy. I have some applesauce. In that sweet cute. First class is one before. This was 4:30 to 7:30. All right, and I am on schedule. About assurance again, and you may have alluded to it as well. I didn't hear it, but I would say that the problem, the problem with um, questioning your assurance is that it puts, oftentimes, most times, I think, it puts the responsibility on you rather than on you. Yeah, and I think that's a place where Heidelberg broadly causes us to focus back on Christ. But you do have to examine yourself. Make your calling and election sure. You must examine yourself, but self-examination should always come back to Christ, never left with you. So yes, I'm these things, but am I trusting Christ, who is sufficient and able and fully to take these things? So, so always come back to Christ in self-examination. Thank you. I didn't say that. That's important. All right, we'll go to the law of God then. No, and, I have a question since we have an extra half hour. Whoa, now. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, this is where I'm scheduled. <laughs> so... I mostly learned this from Joe, who reads the Puritans more than I do, but he's talking about how, like, pastorally, they really feel like their congregation struggled with not having assurance. So, I was, and you might not know the answer, but the shorter catechism doesn't have anything on perseverance of the saints or assurance. Do you know of any reason why they would have left that out? Because that seems like if that's the one everybody's memorizing, that... Been a great That's what the children memorize. The adults well, yeah. memorize the larger. So I don't. That's an interesting insight, but I, I don't know uh, why. If there's something in the minutes or not, uh, it had to be shorter. Yeah, I mean, just just one question. That's like, hey, by the way, here's how you know. But it's so thoroughly discussed in the Confession and Logic Catechism as well. I mean, right. are a, a team. Interesting observation. That's true with good works as well, you know. Okay. And almost true of repentance yeah. and faith. But, uh, yeah. And perseverance. Yeah, well, she, I think she said perseverance. Mm -hmm. perseverance. All right. But not on the law. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, Sean Blotzer, we're starting now in paragraph one. We're going to look at what the law demanded before the fall. God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling, and threatened death upon the breach of it, and endured him with power and ability to keep it. So what were the demands of the law, and in what framework did God bring those demands to Adam, Sean? He, um, he brought those um, through covenant, and he demanded obedience. Um, as the uh, Shorter Catechism says, that when God created man, he entered into a covenant of life with them, and ten of on condition of perfect obedience, forbidding him to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil upon pain of death. All right. What are the characteristics of that obedience? Of 
According to the confession, he bound him in all his posterity to personal entire and exact and perpetual obedience and promise and life. So what, is, what, what does those things mean? Personal entire exact and perpetual. Um, that, I mean, I guess there, I'm trying to think of a different way to say them than, than what it uh, means on the surface, but um, it's it's that that um, well, I'm sorry. Perpetual. What's personal? Be, personal is. is himself okay individual so individually individual. responsible as we would be if he had kept the covenant we would always each one be individually responsible to keep the law entire it means that there's no part left out it's the whole thing exact it's it's um it's precise it's um Good, exact. That's what our, all of our evangelical friends get upset about with us. They want to accuse us of legalism, but it's not legalism, it's precision. And that's exact. This, our God, uh, one of the Puritans, John Rogers, was writing uh, out in the area of his church, and the Lord of the Manor, who was opposed to the Puritans, came out and was riding along uh, side of him and trying to get him into an argument. and wasn't having much success so finally in frustration he says why is it that you Puritans are so precise because we serve a precise God that's what exact means so we're going to the heart we're going to the motives we're not looking at uh, easy or superficial obedience and then perpetual means all of our life Never. God's moral law doesn't change. And then in the covenant, life was promised to Adam and through Adam to us and death to uh, the lawbreakers. So we learn back under the covenant, Adam did have the promises and the ability. Now notice well, we talked about the covenant. Adam wasn't tested with the moral law. Adam had no problems with this. But you see, it's when his will was being tested that his person entire exact perpetual obedience failed um, if God had come at him with one of the commandments that was his nature the test is will uh, this tree is simply verboten because God said it was that is uh, where his obedience uh, broke down but we also need to tell people today in our evangelism this is what God expects out of you if you're going to go to heaven God expects you to perform personal, universal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience. Have you done that? Well, who could do that? But God says, you have to do that. God says, love me with heart, mind, soul, and strength. Have you done that? Of course not. Well, then you're going to hell. Because God says, you have to do that. Man, what are you talking about? Well, that's what God says. Now, there's a way out. You want to know about it. But there's one that did this for his people. And he did it perfectly. So that you can meet these requirements of perfect obedience only when you are covered by the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a very important use of law in our evangelism to come back to this type of uh, language. Dr. Piper, so this... So we would say, or we would not say, that the tree was a test, that God tested Adam in that regard? Well, yeah, but that's back under the covenant. Now we're just talking about the moral law. This is what he was bound to keep as well. That's why I said it for you. It wasn't just the test. He was bound to keep all the law uh, as part of the covenant. The test was at the point of the tree of knowledge of good and So this brings us then to what duty God requires of man and its obedience to his revealed will. 
And what did God at first reveal unto man as the rule of his obedience? The rule of obedience revealed to Adam in his state of innocence and to all mankind. And besides the special command, so here it is, not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge good evil, was the moral law. Now, since somebody's going to explain that to us, uh, well, how much of that's in the short catechism? But anyway, um, the rule, you know, which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law. So, um, Adam had to keep the entirety of God's law in order to keep covenant. But, and we must always remember that, but the test was not at the, his heart in terms of his character, but his will. Did he submit to the will of God? So then we come to the question of uh, what is the moral law? It's the declaration of the will of God to mankind, directing and binding everyone everyone to personal perfect perpetual conformity and obedience thereunto in the frame and disposition of the whole man soul and body and in performance of all those duties of holiness righteousness which he owes to God and man promising life upon the fulfilling and threatening death upon the breach so we're no longer the covenant of works but the commandment remains the promise remains and the threat remains so anybody that, and this is why it's reiterated in the Mosaic uh, legislation, uh, that this is a principle that is true that Christ then has fulfilled for us. But if you could keep the law of God perfectly, you would have life. But that's there so that Christ, who did keep the law of God perfectly, merited life for himself and uh, for us. So paragraph two now gets into the law after the fall. And so what are the demands of the law after the fall, Mr. Cook? This law after his fall continues to be a perfect rule of righteousness and as such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments and written in two tables. The first four commandments containing our duty towards God, the other six our duty to man. So Mr. Cook, what are the demands of the law after the fall? Demands of the law are the, the Ten Commandments, uh, giving us our duty towards God and our duty towards man. Okay, so the moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. Delivered the voice of God upon Mount Sinai, written in by two tables of stone, recorded in the 20th chapter of Moses. And the first four commandments contain the duty to God, the other six to man. And then the Shorter Catechism, summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. Now, the law was written on the heart of man as the image of God. It was on Adam's heart perfectly. When Adam sinned, it was defaced, but it remains. That is the basis of conscience. And so in Romans 2, when Paul appeals to conscience. He's saying that the natural man, without any special revelation, sufficiently knows the moral mind of God in order to accuse or excuse. So you see, it was an act of grace that God at Mount Sinai gave then a written copy to correct conscience, to shape conscience, and to give his people this gracious revelation of his will, which is merely the representation of his character, that we might know him better and serve him. Now, one of the little things here, when the standards say that the first four were on one tablet and the other six on another, uh, more recently, uh, one of Meredith Klein's uh, assertions as he studied some Middle Eastern or near, Far Eastern, Near Eastern covenant transactions is that there often there were two copies of the law uh, when a covenant was made. And so his uh, assertion is that uh, the two tablets are actually uh, two copies. So the Ten Commandments are on each tablet. I don't think there's anything wrong with either one of those positions, but just this weekend, I was meditating Sunday morning, and it never had occurred to me before. Uh, when Paul deals with the fifth commandment, he says this is the first commandment with promise. But it's not the first commandment with promise, is it? But it's the first commandment of the second table with promise. The first commandment with respect to duties toward men with promise. And I think there's a a decent inference there 
that uh, we actually have one tablet with the first four, our duty to God, and one with the next five, the first of which has promise, um, which is our duty to our neighbor. But there's obviously no heresy in saying that it's simply two copies of the law. All right, so I trust everybody at this point understands the grace of God in giving his law. Anybody have a problem with that? Speak now or forever fail. Uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> You know, what is it that T. David Gordon says in uh, Not of Law but Faith that Son of Israel made a mistake to accept this covenant at Mount Sinai? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in print. So, no, he didn't. They didn't. It was a gracious act of God who took them in his possession, who's always said, Walk before me and be blameless, and here's how I want you to walk. And uh, the heart of the believer says, Yes, I want to walk that way. This is no bondage. Now, we get the three types of law in uh, paragraph three. Uh, Mr. Cook, now you just had your chance. Mr. Dwyer, besides this law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age. Ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances, partly of worship prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, partly holding forth divers instructions of moral duties, all of its ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the new covenant. So we know what the moral law is, Mr. Dwyer. What's the second type of uh, law? Ceremonial. Ceremonial law had two purposes, and they were? To prefigure Christ um, and to hold forth instruction in moral duty. All right, good. So... Notice the little uh, expression, Israel as a church under age. This picks up Paul's language from Galatians 3 and 4. So in God's providence, the underage church was going to see Christ in types and figures and promises and prophecies. But the underage church also needed a different way of being ruled. So... How many of you have young children? Yeah. Okay. And then some of you, like Ken, have David. You, have, you don't have older children yet, do you? So just. Uh, so little children need a lot more rules, right? You know, don't touch the heater. <laughs> no, you may not play in the front yard. You have to go to bed at 8 o'clock at night. Um, there's a lot of, of extra rules for little children. It's all for their protection and developing of a moral sense. Now, are you telling your teenager don't touch the heater? Or don't go out in the street? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> your bedtime's at eight? Uh, no, in fact, the, if they grow responsibly, you actually give them increased liberty, fewer rules. Uh, teach them to make godly decisions. Adams makes the point, then do that when they're at home still. So you can correct the errors, pick up the pieces. He'd say the difference in a swing issue and a stove issue, you don't want to burn their hands, but they can fall off a swing. Um, and so uh, it's just what God did with his people. So in the Old Covenant, there were all of these extra uh, rules with respect to what kind of clothing you wore and how you do your food. And these weren't pointing to Christ. No, these were rules to keep God's little children safe and to learn that they must live for his glory in all things. So they had food laws, and what are we told? Whatever I do, whether I eat or drink, do it for the glory of God. That was established in the food laws. But now, as we are in the Spirit, and these are not the moral laws of God, then God says, now what I hope you have learned is you eat to my glory. And so the moral principles are there in these ceremonial laws. And some of them are brought out. It's not just the judicial laws. You know, um, not plowing with two different kinds of animals, not wearing... Uh, mixed cloth clothing, do not be unequally yoked. 
And he's just teaching them a principle of exclusivity, of, of separateness uh, that carried over into farming and into dress. And all of these things will come to a, a spiritual... And so they've all been abrogated in that they've all been fulfilled in Christ and the church. Because of Christ pouring out the Spirit, the church moves now into her maturity. And we don't trust the Spirit to teach us new moral laws, but we do trust the Spirit to guide us in making decisions on the basis of God's moral law that will be wise and godly. So that's really, I think, what's at play here. And it's fun to think about. Plus, it's a good way to help our evangelical friends understand. It's also why the Ten Commandments are given. And immediately then, uh, from in chapter 20 through uh, the covenant inauguration in 24, you've got this mixture of moral, ceremonial, and judicial precepts. They're all mingled together. Why? Because they're all application of the Ten Words. And so every judicial law, which we haven't gotten to yet, and every ceremonial law was an outworking of one or more of the Ten Commandments. So there is a, a unity, a harmony here uh, in them and in their expression. You find the same thing in Leviticus 18 and 19 about holiness. Why are they blended? Because these are all applications to the underage church, how she's to work out God's moral law. Now, we're left, as we'll see in the chapter next on liberty, to the leading of the Spirit. All right, Matthew, what's the other type of law? For to them also as a body politic, he gave sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. Judicial, judicial laws. Uh, are the, what would be some examples? Death penalties, um, uh, inheritance things, uh, uh, any of those laws that affected them in terms of the law court and uh, the thing. Now, they have expired with the state, so that, that was the, the state of the church was both political and spiritual. And as a political state, it needed these extra laws as well. Again, many of them point, I think, to Christ, so that uh, cursed is the one that hangs on a tree. Uh, there is the whole curses of, of the law. Uh, the death penalties. Uh, clearly, Christ died under the death penalties of the judicial law. But also, the death penalty of the judicial law teach the church what are those more serious sins, not crimes, but sins for excommunication. If it deserved death in the Old Covenant, then if it is persisted in, then it deserves excommunication in the New Covenant. And the principle of equity, uh, Matthew was getting at. So uh, one of the laws would be that you lived up on your roof and you uh, had to put a little railing around it, a parapet, to protect life. So what would be a principle of equity? All right, your property must be kept safe uh, uh, with respect to others. So if you had a pool, put a fence up. If you've got an upstairs deck, you make sure that it's uh, well uh, guarded. You make sure the rails are not too wide for a child to get its head through. Uh, and so we can take those different laws and we should do much more, I think, of looking for equity. So for 40, 50 years now, the church has wrestled with a thing called theonomy. And theonomy got all kinds of different definitions, and I don't have a problem with all the definitions of theonomy, or with all the tenets of theonomy. But you don't change society from the top down. You don't change government. Uh, you don't do it politically. You don't get these laws in, uh, in order to uh, change society, people must be converted. So part of that is the agenda. A part would be to say that every death penalty of the Old Testament should be carried over uh, today, and we have an obligation uh, to do so. Now, most of them are modern about that, except for murder, 
the death penalties of the Old Covenant could be atoned for. Uh, and obviously, if it were not a persistent hardened sin, but say in the case of Mary, who could have been put to death, but Joseph was going to put her away for being uh, un unfaithful. But in the very last book of the Institutes, Calvin, I think, in his typical way, who believed a lot of these death penalties, gave us a very wise course. And that is, when natural law, in other words, the, how nations responded to these crimes, coincides with the judicial sanctions, it's wise, not necessary, but wise uh, to put them uh, into play. So you put a murderer in prison and you've ruined a family. May his wife divorce him? Well, I'll say by all means she may divorce him because she, he's dead to her by God's law. But others wouldn't say that. But the whole prison system then, um, all we're doing putting the people in prison is breaking up families uh, and creating schools of crime. Whereas if we followed the judicial laws, they would make restitution. Uh, a little beating that hurts but is still merciful. And then you go to work, you're an indentured slave, we put an ankle thing around your ankle, and you're going to pay back your victims. Look what that would do for the uh, tax structure of our states. There's probably no greater welfare and then the prison system, the greatest strains on our... So if we had prison reforms like this that really honored the judicial law, it's got manslaughter. So the man that didn't intentionally kill somebody still had to live in uh, Jerusalem until the high priest died, you see? Uh, he, could have a, he could have a job, he could have his family with him, but he lost some freedoms because of carelessness. And so there's a distinction between manslaughter and murder. So there's a lot of wisdom there, and we would be much better off looking for the wisdom of the equity principle uh, than um, simply getting all up in arms and arguing about the honor. Is there any helpful resources on applying general equity that you think would be worth uh, taking a look at? The Puritans, uh, Baxter's uh, book on Pastoral counseling. Uh, Perkins has a number of things are all being republished now. Uh, I'm doing his thing, uh, volume 10, and his thing on the economy of, of, of the family is fantastic. And uh, you want to agree with everything in it, but. Uh, Who is that? William Perkins, the greatest. <laughs> it's amazing. He's so clear. I mean, you try to read Puritans, Perkins could have written all this yesterday. Seriously. You're going to love him. And these, these books for well, the first seven volumes are available. Um, they're well worth the money. So, but, so for example, he, he deals with, this is just be one thing he deals with, and they did it in English culture. And that is that engagement was the first stage of marriage. It was a contract that could not be broken. And if either party was unfaithful, it was the same as adultery. Now, you think how that, I tie that into our whole system of courtship. If we had really good biblical courtship, we wouldn't have all of these broken engagements. We still would probably have some, but it'd be very few and far between because a couple move slowly into this relationship. They have their eyes open. That thing he says that the parents need to select for the husband as well as the wife, the partner. Now, the couple have to agree. You don't force someone to marry. But, you know, Joe, I think you should marry Jane and not marry, and here's why. Uh, and the child is to listen uh, to that. Not be bound by it, but listen to that. Vocations. So there's all these things that English culture picked up from Scripture and, and honoring your parents that he sets forth now in the family economy. And although, you know, I'm not going to press that in our culture engagement should be considered a marriage contract. I do bring out then that what we see here is the advantages in our culture of moving back to a uh, not recreation dating. And of course, you take any number of, I'm not advocating one particular kind over another, but the parental involvement with the young people in this pursuit of a spouse. I'm not dating to have fun. 
I should be dating and I'm looking for someone to marry. And thus, I'm not dating. I should be getting to know people uh, so I can find someone to marry. I didn't do that, and I surely wish I had. Nobody uh, in, you know, when I was kind of as a young person, I'm ashamed to say this, but the question was always, um, how far can I go? You know, that was the thing, without sinning. That's just wretched. You know, so, um, so there's a lot of things there that the Puritans uh, have developed. And so uh, Baxter, Perkins, and Ames. Um, it's an area that a lot of biblical counseling has cut itself off from because Jay had this irrational hatred of Puritans. And there is a, a wealth of material there uh, for us to work these things out. All right, good. Now we can go. So I can eat your apples. <laughs> Uh, All right, so next week, uh, we should get on up into the next uh, uh, chapter, which will be, get out of the law, uh, liberty to be worship, right? The Sabbath and worship, I think, is next. 21. Good. So we'll keep inching ahead. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.